It is my distinct privilege this morning to introduce our commencement speaker, Dr. Peter Harstead. If you've had an opportunity to take a look at his biography in the program, you'll see that he's had a long, distinguished career as a historian. Let me just point out two pieces of that because uh, they impacted me indirectly uh, in, in both cases. I had the opportunity to, to visit Peter in action, both when he was the head of the Historical Society in Iowa and also in Indiana. And it was very interesting to see the work that was going on there in both of those states. And, and uh, he played an important role in shaping those organizations while he was there for each of the respective states. Certainly as a professional historian, he could learn a lot about Bethany but he's had a lot of personal connections that have made that study of the history and the impact that Bethany has had on its students uh, on a much more visceral level. His grandfather, for example, is one of the founding pastors of the ELS. If you, I didn't do this, but if you add up all his siblings and uh, his children and grandchildren that have been to Bethany, there's been certainly uh, a long lineage and direct connection to the college for him as well. In addition, he spent a few years here in the early 80s uh, on the, both the administration and the faculty. And so he does indeed have a rich history himself with Bethany. And so with that, let me introduce him and have you welcome him to the podium, Dr. Harstead. Thank you very much, President Bross. Congratulations to each and every 2013 Bethany graduate. Your degree marks a milestone in your life. Stand proud when the time comes. Celebrate with your family and friends. And give your parents a big hug <laughs> before this day is over. Some of you will, will continue your education in graduate or professional schools. Others may be begin active military service. Still others will enter the workforce or attempt to do so, and I wish you very well. Uh, according to the psalmist, you can expect three score years and 10 before you, but the modern statisticians predict that you'll have even more. It is your responsibility to live your allotted time wisely. Whether we articulate it or not, each of us has a worldview. We see the world through the lens of our experience, including our education, the culture in which we live, the books we read, and the core beliefs that we hold. But before I sit down, my goal is to have you thinking about your worldview, your wealth on Shaung, and how it relates to higher education, as well as to your life beyond Bethany. Our method is to use six perspectives, uh, the first of which is from my kitchen. Our house is 20 years old, so we have undertaken some home improvements. Work is still in progress, but the granite countertops are now in place, and they're beautiful. When the installer completed his work and was ready to leave, our daughter, uh, Karen, a student of Bill Bukowski, I mentioned this to uh, uh, get some authority behind this, uh, Karen said uh, to the man, you do beautiful work. And Jeff responded, no, God does. Now this man brings our subject into range. The work of the Almighty is part of his workaday world, which he acknowledges even to people he barely knows. Um, he sets us up for what follows. Now, Carl Becker was an Iowa farm boy who became an eminent historian. He once remarked that the task of the historian is to chase ideas through the centuries <clears throat> and right on down to our present time. How did people of other times and places uh, look at the world? Well, we're off to these views. We've already had the one from my kitchen. Our second perspective comes from a monastery in Bologna, 
Italy in the year 1300. The concept of higher education had emerged there earlier out of the Christian church as it then existed. On a morning, let's imagine it was kind of like this, the professors, who are monks, you want to try this one, uh, professors? Chant a Latin hymn about the judgment day, de res dies ire. Maybe some of the music majors have gotten into this. They are wearing caps and gowns and hoods, similar to the ones that we are wearing today. An English translation of the chant reads, the day of wrath, that day, will dissolve the world in ashes as foretold by David and the Sibyl. Now that's a curious line. Uh, thus there were two sources for establishing truth at this medieval university, one biblical, the other secular. David is the code word for divine truth as revealed in God's word, Sibyl for truth found in secular sources. In classical mythology, Sibyl uh, is a prophetess and she accompanies Aeneas to the threshold of Hades. That's why they're talking about this day of wrath. Now the monks at Bologna go to their classes with their minds steeped in allegory and symbolism and incantations. They pursue truth with their students through the study of the Bible, David, as well as through texts which, from the classical world, Sibyl. They venerate the ancient Greek and Roman texts in their library in much the same way that they venerate scriptures. Now this is a long day before uh, the world of modern science. So there are no laboratories at this university. There are no microscopes, there are no telescopes. At Bethany, where you have these things, you too have sought truth in God's word as well as in textbooks, um, in well-equipped laboratories and in classrooms. However, you did so with, here with a proper distinction between David and Sybil between God's truth and worldly wisdom. A Christian worldview maintains this distinction. This will not always come easily after you leave these halls, I assure you. I shall illustrate this point from my experience. Uh, as a Christian, I believe that God did, can, and does intervene in history, most notably when he sent his son into the world to redeem us. As an historian with six years of formal education beyond Bethany, evaluation of texts and causes and facts, and facts does not come easily for me to think about God intervening directly in history. Only by God's grace is my leap of faith possible. St. Paul wrote truth when he told the Corinthians at Corinth that Christ crucified was, quote, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. You'll meet people like that too. When they are tested, when you are tested, go back to that same first that chapter of Corinthians for assurance that the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Let's move on from, from Bologna. Our third perspective is from a former monastery in northern Germany in 1535, a former monk Dr. Martin Luther has just completed a 500-page commentary in Latin on Paul's epistle to the Galatians. It stresses the justification of sinners through Christ's merit alone. Luther's wife, a former nun, and several children surround him at the dinner table. He is instructing his children in that first article that, uh, that uh, Chaplain Molsta just read to us, I believe that God has made me and all creatures he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members. And don't forget this part of it, my reason and all my senses. Those are gifts of God, and we use them as scholars and citizens of this world. Luther wants his children to include these things in their worldview. Now you know Martin Luther as a theologian, an academic, a humanist of the first order. He sought truth at, in difficult environments. He discarded harmful beliefs that human reason and, and hierarchs had brought into the church. Along with other Protestant reformers, he influenced the way people of the Western world still think, including the revolutionary idea that all people are equal in the sight of God. 
Now, it was not until 1865 that the full consequences of that idea played out in the legal system of our country. Particularly if you are soon entering the workforce, I suggest that you visit the ELS website, then click on the topic Luther, vocation as calling. It's good. Our fourth view is from Isaac Newton's London study in the year 1700. He had recently moved to London to take a government job. He'd moved from Cambridge University where he had taught and conducted scientific inquiries. Science has moved along quite some distance from that medieval monastery. A towering figure of the Enlightenment, he sought universal laws through studies of motion, astronomy, mathematics, calculus, optics, and more. We find Newton studying his Bible, so we will not disturb him. Newton brought paradigm shifts uh, in the way that we regard the universe and the forces at work within it. Some would say that he looked into the mind of God. Now, <clears throat> while you're contemplating your worldview, and particularly those who are going on to graduate school, just remember that one of the greatest scientists of all times was a devout Christian. He saw no conflict between science and his Christianity. In contrast to Newton, many other Enlightenment figures, including a group of French rationalists, insisted that God was not a factor in this world or any other realm. For them, the only way to pursue truth was through human reason. Sybil was in, God was out. Thomas Jefferson, an Enlightenment figure, went to the extent of actually editing out of his Bible Christ's miracles and other sections that his reason rejected. Now our fifth view uh, is from the perspective of a Dutch politician, you may not have heard of him, and theologian by the name of Abraham K-U-P-E-R, but pronounced apparently Kuiper. We find him delivering a series of lectures at Princeton University in October, the year 1901. This is the same year that he became Prime Minister of the Netherlands. He came to Princeton at the behest of Woodrow Wilson and other faculty members there. He was weary of the beating that Christianity had been taking from the French rationalists, from Charles Darwin and his followers, the social Darwinists included, and proponents of modernism within the church, and he took the offensive. Coming out of a Calvinist Reformed tradition, Kuiper spoke boldly. I'll quote him here. No single piece of our mental world is to be hermetically sealed off from the rest, and there is not one square inch in the whole human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Kuiper insisted that without God's direct activity, <clears throat> creation would self-destruct. Our sixth and final view is from the suburban home of Nancy Randolph Piercy in Northern Virginia. The year is 2006, and she is mailing the final draft of her next book off to her publisher. The hefty manuscript, primarily about Christian worldview, is titled Total Truth, Liberating Christianity from its cultural captivity. The book is of particular interest because of its subject matter and also because Nancy attended Bethany uh, in 1973 and President Bruss, Bruss says that he knew her in that context. In the parlance of the day, uh, she does it all as an author, wife, mother, and as Francis A. Schaefer Scholar uh, at the World Journalism Institute. Her website tells what she's been doing since 26. You can go there. Many faculty members are familiar with Total Truth uh, because it was the subject of a symposium on this campus two or three years ago, so you're familiar with this book. Piercy has strong messages for a society mired in a series of things, and I'll rattle them off, but you could add some more to this list. Dead orthodoxy, secularism, skepticism, relativism, political correctness, hedonism, and you could go on with that. She relates that her Christian faith flickered as a young woman until she came to Francis Schaeffer's, Schaeffer's Labrie, it's a chalet in the Swiss Alps, 
Uh, Nancy switched, uh, she, she sandwiched her year at Bethany between two stays at Schaefer's retreat or school. Some of her points bear the marks of Schaefer's Calvinistic theology. But we can only scratch the surface of her book, Total Truth, here now. It presents a consistent Christian worldview based on scripture. Uh, here is a preview of what you will find in the book if you pick it up. She relates that she came to Schaefer as a young religious seeker. This was before she was here at Bethany. Schaefer asks, uh, asked her, along with the other students present, um, to imagine two chairs for non-believers sitting in the naturalist chair all that exists is what can be detected through the human senses, the five senses. The believer sitting in the supernaturalist chair sees the natural world, but in the context of what God has revealed to mankind in his word. The believer has a broader vision, a Christian worldview. Piercy acknowledges the temptation, and I like this part of her book, to sit in the supernaturalist chair on Sunday, or at least for an hour in the AM, and then shift over to that other chair uh, during the uh, work week and surely on Saturday night. Uh, where should you sit in graduate school, on a date, at home, uh, in other areas of your life? There is no neutral space between those two chairs. In winding down this discourse about Christian worldview, let's take St. Peter's advice. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. 2013, <clears throat> 2013 graduates go forth with a Christian worldview to life in accordance with the hope that you have. I have just one final thing to say, especially to those going on to graduate school. Remember, David trumps Sybil. Thank you. At this time, it is my distinct pleasure to give out the Distinguished Alumnus uh, presentation. Each year, it's a group of administrators, alumni, and previous Distinguished Alum holders that get together and look at potential candidates uh, to give this award to. They don't include me. I, the, the few, the few times that I've tried to get information from them while they're in this process, they, I could never weasel anything out of them, so I just gave up finally. So I wait for a call then from, in this case, Jay Creer, who called me this year and told me who the awardee was. And every year, I come to the same conclusion, like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And this year is no exception. And so we get a twofer this year because we had Dr. Harstead who was our commencement uh, speaker, and he is also our Distinguished Alum Award winner uh, today. The, the award goes to an individual who not only has had a distinguished career professionally, which certainly Dr. Harstead has had, but also takes into consideration his role in the community and in the church. And in all of these counts, he has excelled As you heard this morning, already from him in his commencement address, Dr. Harstead clearly has a passion for Christian higher education and for the value of the liberal arts. He certainly has modeled both of those in his career and has always been a cheerleader to encourage people to model that as they move forward, and today was no exception. And so with that, I present to you Dr. Harstead, the 2013 Distinguished Alumnus Award.
Thank you, Dr. Bross, and thanks to the class of 2013 for sharing this day with me. Thank you.